Good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone's been enjoying their summer and staying safe and healthy as the U.S. COVID cases has been going up. Luckily, here in Massachusetts, the COVID cases has been holding steady. Today, I have the pleasure of, to be joined by the chairman of the select board here in Winchester, Massachusetts, Mr. Michael Betancourt. Mr. Betancourt, could you please provide a brief introduction about yourself? Sure. Thank you, Aria. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm the chair of the select board. I'm in my second term, uh, three-year term, so uh, in my uh, uh, fifth year, um, going into my, my sixth year. So um, a, the select board is uh, the policy-making body for the town. We work on the budget. We work on traffic, infrastructure, just kind of a, a, a broad view of everything. The school side of things is really separate from what we do. We work um, pretty closely with the school district and um, the town manager works with the uh, superintendent on the day-to-day -day stuff and we work with the school committee pretty regularly. Um, but, um, you know, when you look at something like COVID, we uh, then are working um, very closely um, in uh, a capacity that we otherwise don't on a daily basis um, because uh, it's something that affects uh, our young people, um, it affects our seniors, and uh, it was really something that, like other communities, we weren't otherwise uh, entirely prepared for, um, and it really put a lot of demand on our resources with the Board of Health and the Health Department. So um, it was kind of putting into place um, e everything the town does and kind of asking it to, uh, asking the town to do um, a lot very quickly, and so that's what uh, we've been doing. We also have a great relationship with uh, Winchester Hospital. So, um, you know, we were able to keep things moving um, pretty quickly as far as uh, information exchange and things like that. So, um, in my um, uh, personal life, I have uh, uh, family in town. We've been here about 10 years. Uh, I've got uh, daughter Grace uh, at the high school, as you know, and uh, daughter Violet that's going to the middle school. So, uh, I'm an attorney um, by trade. So, I do that during the day and then uh, I, I do this volunteer position uh, in the evenings. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Now, I know you briefly talked about what your responsibilities of chairman of the select board were. So I'm just going to go to the next question, which was how exactly has coronavirus affected your day-to-day -day responsibilities? So like, what did you not have to do before, which you might have to do now? I know you probably have a lot more work. So could you just speak about that in general? Yeah, it's been um, very intense. Um, I'll say that. I think for um, when you have something that is at such a heightened level of urgency for people um, and they require uh, a more immediate response, it's difficult for local government that otherwise is used to moving um, very, very slowly, deliberately, but still, you know, not at a fast pace. So um, when decisions need to be made, um, on an hourly basis um, and you can't be physically with people. You're trying to get people in Zoom calls and trying to, you know, like we're doing here and uh, trying to make sure everybody's voice is heard because decisions that we make, um, they affect a lot of people. If you close the schools down, everybody is um, at least kept from interaction, but then you have a lot of working families that that impacts. And um, that's, you know, another decision. You know, we, we also, um, you know, you, you look at our, our businesses um, uh, downtown and throughout Winchester, and they certainly were impacted. And so we've been meeting very regularly with um, the Chamber of Commerce and trying to do some creative things with outdoor dining and uh, try to attract people back to the town center um, in a forum where they feel comfortable. Not everyone is going to feel good about um, going back into a, um, a, a small shop at this point. Um, and uh, people are really more starting to um, go to restaurants and back to grocery stores and things like that. But we still have to um, make sure that we um, are, are pumping the brakes and uh, not kind of um, putting our foot on the accelerator too much because Massachusetts has been uh, a very strong um, state to respond to the um, COVID-19 pandemic. But, um, you know, it's, it's something that can slip away from us if we, um, if just go back to our our old habits so right um, could you um okay that great so could you describe how uh the how things in winchester how COVID in general in winchester has been handled since it was introduced the lockdown was introduced in march until now and 
what do you what do you see are the challenges that the Winchester community would have to face going forward? I, I think the uh, it's a good question. I think that um, at the very beginning of this, um, uh, we we were not um, all aware all aware of what was going to be happening. We had um, there was one um, family of a um, student at the Ambrose School, and we the it was reported to the um, health department. And so the Board of Health got involved and the select board and we were kind of wondering, you know, what do we do with this information? Um, and so we uh, eventually we closed school for uh, a day or two at the beginning. Um, and we thought, well, that's, that's all it's going to be. And then we're going to be back next week. And then we did for two weeks. And so, uh, and then we did it for the whole, you know, school year. So um, it's, it's hard when you are um, not really sure what's happening in front of you and uh, uh, there's no playbook for it. So I think that there's a lot of anxiety now where people feel like, okay, we did the hard work, we stayed at home, we didn't go to school, we didn't go to work, we wore masks. Um, and now everybody is kind of done with it. Um, where we're really still considering that we're in the same place mostly. Uh, numbers are down, but the, the risk level is still high as you see throughout the country. So we're just trying to make sure that people understand that um, whatever age group you're in, um, that uh, even if you're not at, at a high risk age group, you're still, if you contract COVID and you're going to see your grandparents or you're going to see someone uh, uh, that is in a uh, compromised uh, health situation that you're, you're at risk. So I think moving forward, our biggest risk is, um, the school factor is going to be a big one because that doesn't mean just kids going back to school, but it means parents going, being able to go back to work and, um, and having some normalcy. Um, but then, uh, you know, also keeping, uh, keeping people wearing masks and washing their hands and sanitizing and, uh, and being careful. So um, it's, it's finding that balance that uh, is really, really tough with a pandemic uh, like this one. Right, and I couldn't agree more because I think it's really important that people understand that though the numbers are down, it's drastically easier for the numbers to shoot back up than it is for the numbers to continue to steadily go down. So, yeah, yeah. and so what are the long-term ramifications you could see that uh, that might infect the community, that might infect the state of Massachusetts um, in, with this COVID-19? Uh, well, there's, um, as you kind of mentioned at the outset, the, there are real financial concerns. Um, and uh, Winchester is lucky in the sense where we don't have a lot of state aid uh, for our day-to-day -day operations, but we do have um, quite a bit of state aid that goes to our schools, to the Chapter 70 um, funding program. So um, we rely on that, um, you know, more than anything. And so if um, schools are hit hard and there's uh, more money that is going to be required uh, of the dist districts but are not funded by the state government um, and the state government is not funded by the federal government, then um, there's going to be cutbacks that are going to be very painful, especially for uh, a town like Winchester that enrollment is increasing and increasing and uh, demands for special education and uh, are, are increasing and even, you know, transportation costs uh, are, are high as well. So um, you figure, you know, even if we go to school uh, in the fall or, and we're uh, kind of, uh, you know, alternating, well, that's, you know, more buses for kids if that's possible. That, I don't know. There's a lot of, a lot of variables that are, um, that really every community needs to decide on their own, but that long-term impact is, is financial. I mean, if the, the state is looking at a, um, an, an enormous, you know, three to four billion revenue decline, you know, quarterly. Um, that's something that wasn't really prepared for. So um, I think the state has done an excellent job and the governor has done a good job of managing the rainy day fund. Um, and I know a lot of people have uh, gotten on his case about it a little bit saying, hey, you know, there's plenty of money there, you know, we got to spend it, we got to spend it. And so at least we weren't as in an awful position as we could have been if um, we didn't set some money aside to protect us. But um, I think there's a concern that when we um, look at future fiscal years, um, we're, we're not going to be able to um, kind of piece together things as easily um, as we have now. Um, and even now, it's, it's been a real struggle. 
Okay, so in your opinion, how long do you think um, the Massachusetts and maybe Winchester, how long do you think it is projected will take to recover? Because I know, obviously, we are being hit uh, very hard economically. So like just how, what, what do you think is the timeline or time span that it might take? You know, it'll take a few years, I think. Um, and uh, in, in whatever capacity that is to, you know, get back to what we consider normal. The economy was in a very um, strong position um, pre-COVID. So um, it's um, going to be hard for us to move back up to that level. But I think Massachusetts is well positioned for that. I think that the tech sector, um, which kind of drives the re region, um, is still going to be in um, demand, especially the, the biotech and pharmaceuticals. So, um, you know, but, uh, you know, it's the Boston area too is um, uh, education is, is a big business and, and making sure that, that um, you know, our schools are firing on all cylinders is, is important as well. So uh, it's, um, we'll, we'll see. It's um, uh, the, the outlook I, th I think is, is positive, uh, but um, I think it's, um, uh, which is important, but I think, you know, we, it's, um, it, it still could change. Um, and so it's just being prepared for that change. Okay. Well, okay, so this next question kind of relates to education. So mm -hmm. how do the priorities change in terms of elementary, middle, and high school, whether it's reopening, because maybe maybe in elementary school, you might have to be more concerned because kids might not um, stay six feet away or things like that. So how do your priorities change between the different levels of schooling? Yeah, well, it's, um, you know, the school committee and the superintendent deals um, mostly um, with the, the school side of things. Um, but I'll say, you know, anecdotally, you know, um, that I think when you have uh, younger kids and especially um, kids that uh, have uh, different learning needs, um, it requires almost a parent to be there um, that is, uh, you know, working with them and, and facilitating that process if it's a remote one. Um, and uh, so that's difficult. Um, going back to school, um, when you look at the high school, um, the classes are larger there. So you, and you have more kids and the high school has already exceeded the capacity that it was built for, um, even though it was only just opened a couple years ago. So, um, it's it's hard to manage the volume of kids going through there and providing the same level of education. Although I do think that the um, high school students are are a little bit more adept at um, you know working and studying remotely. Um, you know it, it's um, it, it, it's still an impact, and that, that's that's where I think the, um, the the funding needs to be there in order to um, you know provide masks and to. Um, you know, provide some flexibility because it's not just going back for the students, but it's going back for the teachers, right? And they're, um, you know, we, we don't want to put them at risk either. Um, or it's, you know, teachers that if you're doing uh, remote learning, uh, they are um, working and teaching classes at home while their kids are at home. Like uh, my wife is, uh, is a teacher and is, um, she's actually doing a, a, a summer class um, right now in the other room and teaching. And so, uh, it's a big, the, the remote learning is, is difficult um, and it's um, very different from the classroom setting. So uh, it requires uh, a lot, a lot more support and a lot more financial support, Frank, you know, right. to be frank. Right. Um, so, and these are, these next ones are pretty general. So what do you think um, the town and masters has been doing right? And what do you think could be done better when handling this pandemic? Well, I, I think, um, you know, we, we've, um, everybody came together very quickly and uh, we came up with a, a response team that included the police and fire, the town manager, members of the select board, members of the school committee. So we were communicating very well. And I think that that was helpful um, because we were all learning as we went along. Um, communicating with the hospital as well was helpful for us because we were able to um, really know what the local impact um, was of COVID. I think you, um, Winchester being relatively um, affluent um, as a community was a little insulated from some of the risk um, because a lot of people could work uh, at home. 
but a lot of them, uh, a lot of people couldn't, and a lot of them were at risk. You know, we have as many seniors in town as we do students, and I think people forget that. And so one of the things that we started um, with the United Way um, was a, a partnership where we would raise money to directly fund needs for people that were out of work or couldn't pay their rent, um, you know, couldn't have food. And so I think um, communication at that level and um, making the right decisions um, and working with other communities as well to hear what they're doing, but also providing direct resources to uh, Winchester residents um, is, is helpful. We've also uh, established a reopening um, committee for um, businesses, restaurants. Um, so we're communicating about those things as well because uh, even the real estate sector was limited as what they could do. I, you know, they weren't um, terribly happy with us because we restricted them for a period of time during the surge period uh, of going into homes and bringing other people as you normally would do. Um, and uh, we felt the risk was, was too high with um, people moving in and, in and out of, uh, of homes that they weren't otherwise familiar with. So uh, it, it's things like that that you don't anticipate um, that I think we were able to respond to pretty well. And, um, and I think that we, 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 we kept the communication with the community uh, uh, you know, pretty strong. So that, that, that was helpful. Great. So um, I know this next question doesn't really have a straightforward answer and it might be a little bit too much on the educational side of things, but uh, so there, of course, as you know, there is a cost of, um, that is associated with reopening schools due to this pandemic, whether it be needing more space because to, to separate, to spread out children, getting masks for social distancing, or even like plastic dividers for the desks. And I know, I also know that eight, only 8% 8 comes from, the, uh, of this funding comes from the government and 92% comes from taxes, but the government has only provided us with $13.5 billion to deal with reopening schools um, when it is projected that we would need $116.5 billion to successfully reopen it and everyone to be safe in the schools. So do you think this is a point of concern and or do you think the way like the 92% of the taxpayers that are paying to help this would be enough to take care of the funding? Yeah, I mean, we need the support of the federal government. And unfortunately, I think that there are a lot of political implications um, that have been um, tied to, um, you know, state support um, for COVID response. Um, I think Massachusetts has done pretty well. Um, it, it's been uh, a, a very rocky road, but I, we, we will need um, federal support for um, to, you know, to, to fund our future needs. There's just no way we, we are going to be able to do it at the state level. So, um, um, and certainly that trickles down to the local level um, because uh, as I said, uh, if we are, we anticipate every year certain increases in uh, needs for our schools. Um, and so we budget those increases and hopefully in the, the two and a half percent um, range, which is, is what we're allowed to increase it. Um, but, you know, those, um, if those resources aren't there and they say, oh, we're just going to fund you at the same level uh, as we did last year, um, that means that we have to cut something from the budget and what usually gets cut um, are schools um, and uh, uh, staff because those are the, 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 the biggest ticket items because our, our schools are more than 60% of our, our operating budget. So. Okay, well. Um, do you have any parting thoughts to add before? Uh, I, I don't. I, I, I thought your website looked great. Um, very detailed, very informative. Um, great job. Um, I, I saw that you put a, um, a, a section on the um, Black Lives Matter on there, um, which um, I thought was good as well. I think that's part of the COVID response that, um, you know, is, is something to consider as well, that um, wherever your perspective is, there is a heightened level of anxiety um, out there um, about all of these things that people are experiencing. And so um, that, that fear factor and that anxiety uh, is very real. And so um, I think um, it's uh, great to acknowledge it as part of the, um, the data that you're providing. Um, and, uh, and I appreciate that um, in-person interview um, you know, through Zoom at least. It's fantastic. Coming on. Well, 
thank you so much. Um, I thank you so much for your time and I worked hard. I tried to not ask too many questions about reopening schools, but I'm sorry if I let a few slip. No, out. no, it's good. Yeah. No, it's, it, it's important. And I, I yeah. appreciate it. It's a big part of what we do. Right. But I do understand that, and I hope everyone understands that there's a lot of uncertainty that is coming along with this pandemic. So I just hope people keep that in mind whenever they have suggestions and stuff like that for the governor, whether it be for the governor, for the town, or anything of that nature. Well, it is, once again, it's been an honor to speak with you, and thank you so much for your time, Mr. Ben Me too. Thanks, Aria. We'll see you soon, all right? Take yep. care.